Money woes, English literature, women's rights, football games, all-nighters, and U.S. foreign policy. Personal writings by Cornell students since the university's earliest days touch on subjects wide-ranging, yet also familiar. First Person Cornell presents student letters and diary entries of the past, together with email and blog postings of today, discussing her newest book and a recent chats in the Stacks Book Talk at Man Library. Author Carol Kamen profiles some of the book's featured student writers in the college life they describe, presenting a lively exploration of a major rite of passage in American cultural life. A live reading by current Cornell students, Leah Barrett, Amy Shim, Stephen DeGro, and June Mears Bicky, who take the part of Cornell diarists and bloggers past and present, brings to life students' experiences over the last 150 years. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would like you to hear me because um, I love talking about this book and I love what's going to happen next, which is more, more interesting than I am. Um, but I wanted to tell you what I'd like to do today. Briefly, I tell you, I'd like to tell you why, we ha why this book came about. And then I'd like to make some observations about what we can learn from the material. And then I will turn things over to my four wonderful students. And what they will do is give you a flavor of what is in the book. Um, I teach something called History 126, which is the history of Cornell University. Um, it's a unique course. Obviously, nobody else would teach Cornell University's history. Um, but nobody teaches a university's history in the country. So it's a unique course. And I do a lot with the students. Um, getting them used to libraries, using libraries, and we use Cornell as our, as our focal topic. Uh, my students research in Cornell history, and they write papers about their research. They, um, for example, they've written papers about students voting in local elections, which has always been controversial. My students contribute to Cornell history by creating scrapbooks, and those scrapbooks are now in Crock Library. There are more than 400 of them. Um, this is my last year teaching, and so there'll be about 430 or 40 when I'm done. And I'd like to say they're the most beautiful collection of things I've ever seen. Um, the scrapbooks are annotated. They're not just flat pictures or objects. They are full of things like parking tickets, um, <laughs> drink bracelets, pictures, condoms. You remember the year when Cornell was giving out condoms to everybody? Well, we've got more condoms in the library than one would like to think about. Um, they come in a variety of, of sizes and shapes, and it's totally up to the students what they do. Some look like calendars with pages you flip over. Um, some are watercolored. I uh, get a number on CDs, which I don't always love, but I'm learning how to be modern. Um, some are large, big books. Some are very small. Small. One came in a box that a student had, had created by herself, and then inside the box were various shapes, um, like octagons and triangles, and she had written her comments on the shapes. The writing was terrible, but the box was great, so she got a great, great grade. Um, they I've had one, one student give his his um, scrapbook in a tube, and they were all round up little messages in the tube. That too wasn't great, but it was interesting. Um, and last semester, I had a student come in at the end of the class, put her backpack on the table, and said, there's my scrapbook. And I said, I don't want your backpack. I want your scrapbook. She said, it is. And then she started to unfold her scrapbook for me, um, which contained a drink container, a plastic banana to represent all the bananas she ate during class, or the ones that she got out of the, out of the, 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 the RPU in the places where kids eat. Um, she had in it the goggles from her dreaded, hated chemistry class. She had lots of essays in it, and it was just this whole compilation. So I took the scrapbook, the backpack to Croc Library, and I said, this is one, and so it's there today. So they contribute in interesting ways, and these scrapbooks are just full of marvelous information about student life. And students read Cornell history. 
Um, I give them Carl Becker, who is the world's most wonderful writer. Um, they don't always think so at the beginning. They get more used to it as time goes on. How are you doing, Carly? Do you like him better? Okay. Um, but I sort of force it down their throat. And, but they really come to enjoy Carl Becker and, and to figure out what he's doing when he's thinking about being a historian and shows you, takes you through that process. They read a little from Morris Bishop's Great History. Uh, I don't assign it because it's $56, which I think is like a heavy load. Uh, but they read some from Morris Bishop. They read E.B. White, and they read a number of people who have written Cornell history. And then I looked around and realized that there is almost no university in the country that uses what students have to say about their own experience. And here's where I, I do my love song to Cornell libraries. Um, I decided I'd better find out what I could. Um, what material was there that students had actually created? Where are the letters and the diaries that students had written? Um, I went to the libraries and began to find wonderful material. There are memoirs. Um, like James Gitlis's memoir of the 1930s when he talks about being a poor student walking here from Binghamton, which is a long hike, um, and how he worked his way through school. Um, memoir by um, Stanton Griffiths, who grew up in Ithaca, uh, and talked about the fact that when he graduated from Cornell, he made so much money working on the sun that it took him more than 10 years to make that much money when he was out of school. Not, most, not many students have that experience. I found comments about students' lives at Cornell in biographies. Um, there's a biography of E.B. White by Cornell faculty member Scott Elledge from the English department. And there's a whole chapter on White at Cornell. And there's a chapter on Margaret Morgan's experience in the 1930s as a black woman at Cornell written by her daughter. Um, rather bitter memoir of what she went through when she was here. But it gives us a different perspective on, on what's going on or what student life was like. And then I looked for diaries and letters. The first diary I found was a published diary, a man by the name of David Cogan, Cornell class of 1950. Um, he died within the year. He became sick when he was a senior. He died within the year. Um, David Kogan, bright, articulate, interesting, curious about women, which they never mentioned in the 19th century. Uh, he couldn't figure out if he was a good kisser or not and decided he wasn't. Somebody later told me he was a real nerd um, and really was inept. But here's this wonderful diary by this interesting man. Um, diary by Webb Hayes, the, the son of President Rutherford B. Hayes all about his experience at Cornell. Diary kept by Helen Bullard, who was having trouble as a landscape um, architect, or the landscape uh, program here. And um, she was having so much trouble that her professor called her in and said, Helen, you're not doing well. And she said, I know, I try, but I don't do very well. And finally, he said, well, I'd kick you out, but we don't have very many students, so we're going to keep you. And she ended up having a wonderful career. And, and her diary is full of all this inf nice information. And then there are letters. I found the letters of Har Harold Gulvin to his girlfriend, love letters in the 1930s. Not very torrid love letters, but love letters. Um, and it turns out that she was afraid to come to visit him at Cornell because she thought all the co-eds were just too dashing and intelligent for her to compete with. And so during his four years, she never came here. Um, she stayed back home, but he went back home and married her. Um, I found John Detmold's wonderfully erudite, witty, intelligent letters to his mother um, from the 1940s. And in fact, it turns out that the 1940s ended up with the most beautiful material um, that I collected. So I put all of this material together, and we created um, First Person Cornell. So that's the origin of the book. And my students this semester are having to read First Person Cornell, and they will even have to write a paper about it, which probably takes all the fun out of it. Um, but, but they have to do that anyway. So the real question is, what's the value of this? 
to historians or to people who are interested in Cornell history. And I think this material, which is disparate, which is a little bit of this and a little bit of that, because I don't give you the whole letter, because you really don't want to know about their laundry and about Uncle, Uncle Harold and his problems with, with, um, with, with dyspepsia. Um, you really don't want to know about all the cows at home. So I've extracted from these letters just wonderful material. Um, and from the letters and diaries, the emails and the blogs, what you do get are the continuities of student life of this place so that my students um, who take their class in McGraw Hall end up reading about a kid who was actually working on McGraw Hall, was uh, carrying stones when they were building it in 1871. Um, there's, a, there's a nice sense of, 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 um, of here we're in it and he was working on it and, and that's really quite lovely. There is, of course, the continuity of the scenery. Um, and even though Cornell keeps changing and getting bigger, the scenery is something most students comment about. Most beautiful place I've ever been, some students have said. There are elements of student life that, are, that, that show through time, such as study in the library. They do less of it today than they used to because they don't need to quite as much, they think, but they get there. Um, fraternity life, dorm rooms, dorm life the attractions of the opposite sex. Um, endlessly, they talk about the weather. It is always raining, snowing, sleeting, windy, or hot. It's ificating. Um, and they complain about the weather no matter what's going on. Um, and they talk about um, music. Cornell students are always singing. Um, they sing walking up East Avenue past Sage College and some of the women thought maybe that was improper to be sung to. They sing in the chorus, they sing in a cappella groups, they, they sing in fraternity houses, and they sing under the arches. Um, Cornell's, Cornellians have sung over the years, and there are, as you know, lots of Cornell songs. But these materials also suggest change over time. And the changes are really interesting. And I'm only going to mention them because each one could be a, a, a huge subject. You really don't want to hear me as, as, as much as you want to hear them. Um, but the change over time, the ones that, that, the changes over time that interest me have to do with the introduction of women to Cornell and how they come as oddities at a university. Um, women did not go to university in 1868. 1872 when they came here, very few colleges would accept women, and here was a university accepting women. And so they came as oddities to the students um, who applauded them when they came into the classroom. Oh, here come the women, three of them, right? Uh, and you sort of know they're being put on the spot. But when the students are teased about the fact that there are women at Cornell, the male students stick up for the fact they have a right to be here too. So you, you get both sides of the, of the, of the introduction to women here. Um, they're ignored by some men. In fact, some fraternities had fines that, that they fined their students if they were found crossing the arts quad, talking to a Cornell woman. On the other hand, a lot of Cornell men married Cornell women. So they get both, 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 um, both of these are, are shown. We also can see the development of special women's life and culture at Cornell. Women had their own self-government. They had their own drama society. Um, and they had their own dances. Um, women would invite other women to the dance. The tall women would all be women, uh, go as women, and the short women would all go as men. Or the juniors would go as men, and the freshmen would go as women. And, and one woman says, I had a better time at that dance than I did where I went with a man. So these were really popular affairs. Sounds a little strange to us today, but, but they were creating their own culture. And all of this shows up in, the, in this material. You also can see the really interesting change that happens after the Second World War as women go from being Cornell co-eds to being Cornell students. And that's a very significant shift. Um, and it has to do with numbers. It has to do with changing times. It also has to do with the fact that during protests, we had women joining them in the 1950s. They hadn't been there earlier. So, so women are really joining in and becoming students. 
There's also the transformation of the Greek society, of the Greek, um, Greek societies, from very elite groups to groups that are somewhat more diverse today. Um, and uh, repeatedly in the materials I get from students today, um, the Greek letter societies are spoken of as social service, having a social service mission. Well, I don't quite believe this, but I do remember some rather boozy days that they're trying to live down. And, and by going down and helping with children at GIAC, that's their social service mission. Um, I only believe it halfway, but you can see some of that. You can see changes in the university regulations, certainly over women and over the dormitories. You can see the change from dormitories into residence halls. Um, and actually, with the first dormitories, the f well, women's dormitories, they really were residence halls to begin with. Then they become dormitories, which are much more anonymous places where much less happens in them in terms of intellectual life. And now you see this return under Hunter Rawlings to a dormitory as a residence hall with a whole intellectual life of its own. You can see the difference um, of attitude about food. At first, Cornell food was to be avoided. Today, the students brag about what, how good the food is, and they worry about freshman 15. You can definitely see the difference in use of alcohol. It's never mentioned um, by anyone I have read. I'm sure they're drinking surreptitiously, but it's never mentioned in anything I've read up to about 1930. By the 1930s, we begin to hear about it. The big taboo, the big vice early on was dancing. Mrs. White didn't approve. Mrs. Cornell didn't approve of dancing. So dancing was the big vice at first. Mr. Cornell did approve. Uh, Mr. White did approve. Um, so we have dancing at first. And then, of course, we have alcohol use by students today um, by both genders um, in, in ways that sometimes surprises people my age and alarms us. Um, but there it is. It's, it's in this material. We can see changes over time of students' relationships to their family, from checking in with family and reporting how much money they've spent, um, what they did every day, to parents being, in the 1960s, tolerated but not seen very much, to a new relationship that is really developing and seems very common today among students. My parents are my best friends, which sometimes comes as a shock to people my age see changes in the amount of student autonomy that the students assume on their own, how individually they take on more responsibility for their lives. And over time, their diaries go from journals in which they report things into um, such as activities and what they did during the, during the day to the self as object. Um, and you all know about people's closed diaries with little locks. Well, we've become much more self-absorbed, and that shows up in, in this material. I think one of the biggest changes you can see in this material is the change in the culture of writing. And I am not complaining about how well or how badly students write today. Students have always written well, and some have always written badly. But there is a culture of writing that has changed. It used to be there were accoutrements to writing, such as pen, paper, ink, stamps. There was the time spent sitting at a desk, writing or a table, writing letters, having a stack of letters, putting them in the mailbox. There was the anticipation that there would be letters in the mailbox for you in return. In fact, Mrs. Moffat, whose son was here in 1872, wrote to John and said, John, you were writing us two letters a week. I don't think that's enough. I'd like three. Um, my students today claim that not one of them in the class has stamps in his or her desk. We all went to school with stamps. We expected to write home. Not having stamps is a real indication of a huge shift that's going on. It's a shift that scares historians. What are we going to read? Um, if, we, if these kids aren't writing home, where are, where are the letters we're going to snoop into? On the other hand, they do have email, voicemail, IM messages, phones, and they are using them. Communication has been speeded up. 
it's more hurried, they write more quickly, most of them, and the accoutrements of the culture of communication have changed, but the communication goes on. The pleasure of pen on paper, which I always loved, is gone, but so is writing on clay tablets gone. Uh, you know, so we, we do learn to move on. As a historian, I worry about this, um, but I know that we are still getting the basic thing, which is communication out of letters. So this material can show us the constants that are here, and it can indicate some of the changes. It doesn't prove anything, but it sometimes give a, gives us a way of talking about change over time among student lives. So what I'd like to do um, is, is, is share with you what, these, what this material sounds like um, because every time I find a new cache of letters or every time I open a new diary, I begin to hear the voices in my head. Um, Webb Hayes with a husky voice and John Detmold with a rather smooth voice. Mr. Detmold is still alive with a smooth, polished voice. I hear high women's voices and low women's voices. And that's what I'd like to do today. Um, Leah, Amy, Steve, Jude. We will try to give you a sense of what's in the book. Cornell celebrated its opening with an inauguration celebration on October 7th, 1868. On that day, John Davis of Auburn, New York, <coughs> sat down in his room in Cascadilla Hall and wrote home. My room is number 158. First floor, south wing, south side of the hall, and second west of the main entrance. My room is nine feet one way and 12 feet the other, and 12 feet high. I have one large window on the south side, three feet wide and eight feet high. My door opens opposite the dumb waiter room by which the coal is hoisted from the basement. In 1875, Martha Carey Thomas came to Cornell reinvented herself from Minnie and became M. Carey Thomas, very grown up. At Cornell, <clears throat> she too was concerned about her room. We all four set about the business of choosing rooms. Miss Hicks and her friends want those blue rooms with the partition between in the third hall, which are one of my choices, but they are $5 a week, and counting 40 weeks, that is $200. If you think this is too expensive, I am perfectly willing to take two back rooms. Although, I do like the prestige of having a nice room at first, but I will do as you think is best. Jessie Bolton was of a different mind about her room. <clears throat> I'm going to change my room and take a roommate. I concluded $7 a week was too much for board, so I thought I would come down a little. Anyhow, the girls all fix up their rooms here so much, and I concluded that I would rather take a cheap room and fix it up a little than have a dear room not fixed up. The university did not provide housing for men until after World War I. <clears throat> in 1906, Forrest Lee looked about Ithaca for a room. We spent the afternoon looking for a room. The cheapest we could find were about $3. I hunted all over the town, couldn't find anything I liked. There seemed to be something the matter with all of them. About noon, I was pretty homesick. Then Corman told me about this place. I liked it fine as soon as I saw mm. it. It is on the third floor, but light and airy. There is steam heat and electric light here. Two rooms, single beds. In 1947, Janet Hamber wrote, I arrived at Ithaca at, seven for at 6.45 after seven hours. Now I just have to describe my room dorm. It's beautiful, much nicer than my room at home. The walls are a light natural color, the bed spreads and rugs are green, and one lamp is red and the other eggshell. The closet is big enough to sleep in, has two shelves, a rack for shoes, rod for clothes, and numerous hooks. The furniture consists of a bookcase, desk, very much like the one you have at home. A chair that has cushions, a dressing table, a bench, and a single bed. I also have a private telephone. I can't get over how beautiful it is. Fraternity life was important at Cornell from the start, partially to provide a sense of belonging, but also because it provided housing for male students. Fraternity hazing, however, was not always carefree. A freshman was asked to join Kappa Alpha, and as they say, they were taking a preliminary walk, as they called it, which most people meant being initiated. 
He was blindfolded and was being led about by, Wa by Wason and Lee, both of 76, when they all three suddenly disappeared. They had tumbled over into the gorge. <laughs> Leggett died soon afterward. At the inquest, members of KA testified that he was with them of his own free will. Greek life became identified with college life and the women at Cornell wanted an organization of their own. 1880. This afternoon, one of the girls, a senior, came to me and asked if I would be in favor of a secret society among the girls and if I would join. The object of the society or fraternity is to further literary culture. There are only three of us at present, but we expect one or two more. College life has always been about new experiences, and they are well represented in the comments the students made. Kaysen and I had our heads examined by a phrenologist. There is little truth and considerable humbug about the science. After dinner, went to the polls and, I, and deposited my maiden vote without being challenged. I took the Republican ticket straight. 1915. I saw my first aeroplane Saturday at a distance and had quite a near view of it yesterday. There is a new aeroplane factory in Ithaca, the Thomas Aviation Corp, and it has just completed a new military <coughs> trainer, which is very successful. Frank Burnside is running it, and he has been taking it up every afternoon. Yesterday he established a new record for climbing, reaching 4,000 feet in seven minutes. It certainly is a bird. I'd love to go up in it. 1928. I went to chapel last Sunday, and the sermon was not very good. Cornell is supposed to be the godless college, but a lot of students go to church. The chapel is non-sectarian. Anyone can go. 1930. I have been figuring out a schedule of classes. I am afraid I won't have any afternoons to work with in this term. I am going to have classes every afternoon and on Saturday. I hope if I have a son that he won't have to work his way all the way. It is going to make this last year extra hard. I am afraid especially this term. I am ready to dig in, though. Say, but it is hard trying to figure out what to take. Some things you can't take because it comes at the same time as some other course. I would like to specialize in something. What I need, then, is a job to get experience. 1940. For the rest, there are my courses, which excite me hugely. I'm all registered and ready to go, and have I ever got a program? No classes before 10 o'clock, and none at all in the afternoon. <laughs> I work three hours, beginning at 10 on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Two hours, beginning at 10 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And on Saturdays, just one class at 11, which, you will admit, is deliverly. I've got a drama course with Henry Myers. We read some 15 representative classical and modern plays in one term. Sounds good. And had some trouble about a second English course, which I needed since I'm majoring in this stuff. <laughs> Louis McNeese, the eminent modern, has had to return to England to fight the war, so there is no poetry course available until next term. Well, I've registered in all that rot. My bank balance is now down to $135.75. I've paid my tuition, bought a CUAA ticket, $16.50, and books, $18.75, although I haven't gotten my English history book yet because the co-op was all out of them. And the university challenged students to think about themselves. November 24th, 1947. What are my wants? To study the Jewish heritage, to be well-groomed and in the best physical health, to catalog my faults and correct them, to satisfy sexual desire consistent with an honorable character and wholesome personality, contemplate, evaluate, and improve my living, to successfully pursue Cornell studies, to read wisely and record the reading, to plan and complete the action which make me a better being, to honor my father and mother, and perhaps more. And it also challenged some parents' ideas as well. I just read a Look Magazine article on co-ed dorms that claims the participants don't even alter their study habits considerably. It says they only study and eat together, but bathe and sleep separately. It says their grades have actually improved. It says that it offers a much more mature and valuable approach to living. And I say, don't you believe it. <laughs> the students have always had a great deal to say about the faculty. Dr. Wilder gave a lecture in which I think he rather upheld the use of liquor, at least that of wine. I think it will produce some discussion. Professor Rorig is our French teacher this week, and we all look forward to a pleasant time. We change profs every week and always look forward to Professor Rorig's week as the pleasantest and most instructive. 
He tries to make us speak French only on Fridays. Dr. Wilson gave us a miserable lecture, really a rehash of what he told us several times before. Dr. Wilson informed us that he would be absent during the remainder of the week. I did not notice anyone shed tears at the announcement. 1880. I don't like the professor of chemistry very much so far. He lectured a whole hour the other day without saying much of anything. 1894. The professors in this university treat us like a lot of machines, especially Professor Tyler, who exacts entirely too much work time for his work. It's all very well to say, don't work, but it isn't so easy not to do so when the work piles up so fast. 1896. My dear Mr. Otto, the French instructor, has been called back to Germany, and I have gone into Mr. Siegel's section. Mr. Siegel is, if possible, a little more disagreeable than Mr. Otto. 1913. The new instructor in biology is the awfulest crank you ever knew. 1914. Professor Durham is a wonderful scholar, but his morals and principles are rather loose. 1919. I had to sit behind, beside the man of horrors who always makes me shake and shiver. I told him I had little time to think of a subject, and he told me I had the same 24 hours a day that he had. 1946. My physics instructor wears long hair, is a shabbily dressed young man about 25, doesn't know how to teach, and smiles, giggles, or laughs after every word. It is more of a course in abnormal psychology. <laughs> 1948. Dean Allen was here. She's a conceited, swaggering bag if I ever saw one. Just looking at her annoys me. 2004. My TA just opens his mouth and stupid things come out. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, in 1934, Mary Fessenden found her professor quite interesting. Dr. Meckel is the first woman professor I've had, except for hygiene. Thursday was sort of exciting when a live frog jumped out of his jar, but Mrs. Meckel persuaded him to get back in. Organic chem is pretty easy, I think. Mostly memory and nothing much to figure out for ourselves. The professor wears coral nail polish. There are about six or eight girls in this section for a change. Tuesday we had a physics lab in which we had to measure the length of the floor of the physics lab ten times, just to prove that we weren't as accurate as we thought we were. There are three girls all together in the section. And there was appreciation. After services, I went back to the United Religious Building and saw 150 Jewish students listening to the entertaining talk of the most lovable professor on campus, Harold Thompson, the head of the American Literature Program here. He's a roly-poly cheery man with twinkling blue eyes, a third-generation American of Irish descent, and his specialty is studying man's folklore. He spoke on Yiddish folklore, playing rare Jewish records from his private collection telling about his walks in the east side during the summers ten years ago with a Jewish friend, picking up legends and songs of the immigrants. He told touching stories he got from refugees at the Ontario camp near here, read the words of Yiddish songs in English, they sounded so funny, and read other song titles in Yiddish with English letters, that sounded funnier. The audience loved it. Sunday night, the little man is giving a presentation of Irish-American humor at the browsing library, and I can't wait to hear him again. M. Carey Thomas, who, became, who later became president of Bryn Mawr, had been warned by her father to avoid the ruffians who attended Cornell, men who were here to study agriculture and engineering, not gentlemen. She wrote to assure him that she was being treated with courtesy. The gentlemen's students treat the ladies with the greatest deference and respect. They will even wait in the halls to open a door for you. And in analytical geometry, I happened to get there the other morning before the recitation, and there were about 15 men talking and laughing rather loudly, and immediately every hat was taken off and their whole manner changed. I am a complete convert to co-ed, as the term is here, and even when last week I stood up on the platform, gazed at by 80 masculine junior eyes, and read my essay, though it was a severe proof, my belief did not waver. She was also worried about intense relationships with women. Well, I have gone and done it, I may as well confess. Ever since the first, I have struggled against it. I made up my mind that up here, at least, I would not have a friendship that was in the least bit absorbing. It takes time, and I don't approve of them. Still, I knew from the first that I should like Miss Hicks very much, but did not make one advance. Indeed, the first week we were here, it came up in the course of conversation, and I said that I had made my mind up not to have any intimate friendships, and she took that as a hint and carefully avoided showing that she liked me. It was dancing in Swinebird that did it. I began to see more and more of Miss Hicks. She got in the habit of coming and reading me her mother's letters and of bidding me good night. We used to go and study sometime in Cascadilla Woods, and when it would get dark, we would sit under her blue shawl and talk. 
Then we came across Swinebirds, Atalanta and Caledon, and Miss Hicks would come in her wrapper after I was in bed, and we would read it aloud, and we learned several of the choruses. One night, we had stopped mm. reading later than usual, and obeying a sudden impulse, I turned to her and asked, Do you love me? She threw her arms around me, and I whispered, I love you passionately. She did not go home that night, and we talked and talked. She told me she had been praying that I might care for her. Jessie Mary Bolton graduated in 1883, a very proper young woman. She wrote somewhat disproving, disprovingly <coughs> about the men she encountered at Cornell. However, she ended up marrying one. October 8, 1879. The boys are quite rude here, and they seem to be very fond of applauding. When the girls came in, immediately we received a perfect round of applause. Yesterday, I was about ten minutes late a lecture in rhetoric, and when I came in, I went up front and took a seat. Immediately, they interrupted the speaker by applauding me. Those are two specimens of their behavior. October 15, 1879. Dr. Wilder called on Mr. Bolton to recite this morning, and as I arose, I received a rather smothered applause. There are about a hundred students in the class, so of course he's not expected to, to distinguish sex by just the names. I'm getting used to these boys, so I don't mind them much. October 17, 1879. The more I get acquainted with the girls, the more I like them. I think, on the whole, I never saw a collection of girls where there were so many nice ones. But dining in Sage College posed a problem for Jessie. I am in trouble about our table again. It is a source of misery to all of us girls, but I don't know how we can get out of it. I am just tired of eating with gentlemen every meal. I think they might all go. I believe in co-education, but I get tired of co-eating. I can endure a surplus of gentlemen in the classes, but when it comes to the table, it makes one drop too many. Women at Cornell created their own social life, having a separate dramatic society from the men, their own women's government, and their own dances. <clears throat> Friday night was the sophomore and frosh dance at Sage. Lenora asked me to go, and I broke my rule of no more dancing to go this once. Each sophomore asked a freshman to go and plays the part of a man, furnishing flowers, etc. Some even got carriages. It was some classy dance, all right. The sophs wore tailored shirtwaists and skirts in a very mannish style, but freshmen wore their very bestest and swellest creations. Of course, I wore my pink gown and with a white carnation presented by my man. I felt real swell. Had an awfully good time. Catherine, Bell, and Lida went from the house here, and they all jo enjoyed themselves as much as I. Met a lot of nice girls, and it sure was good fun. In 1903, President Sherman worried that Cornell students studied too much, especially the women. In 1896, all sage is developed into a mill which is grinding day and night. Every other door almost is adorned with a sign, busy. Please do not disturb, are very common. One says, please make your calls short. My room was filled with mathematics st students the other evening, and we hung out. Don't bother us. We're working. Bessie Avery put out the best one, I think. I be a very busy lady. Uh, yesterday, I spent a good part of the day studying for <coughs> analytics. In the evening, Faith, Agnes, and I went to the library where we could get quiet. Verily, I am becoming a greasy grind. I am taking two courses without credit. That is in addition to the regular 18 hours. Didn't have my lesson in German, but didn't have to recite. Worked in drawing for five hours. Finished third sheet in lettering. Broke record again last night. Studied until 2.15 a.m. Cramming, cramming, cramming. Exam in history was terribly long. I wrote two books. I worked the majority of the day on landscape. After prolonged scolding from a professor, he promised to meet me at 10, but got around to it around 12. I'm starting to work with the vengeance. I worked hard all day and spent the entire evening in the library. Sometimes they worried about other students who were not doing well. 1909. We are having a dickens of a time with Ted. That is, getting him back into the university <coughs> and then keeping him at work. The upperclassmen have told him that he will either have to do his work this time or never. But it is another case of trying to make a student out of the other kind of a fellow. You might just as well try to make the other kind of a fellow out of a student. Mary made a 43 on the final with a 62 in the course which, I am afraid, is somehow my fault. And there was despair. <clears throat> Didn't know much today. Was a little late to math. After Lulish went over to the library for a little while, went up and sang tonight, didn't sing worth a hoot. I wish I could do something decent. I have got to look out, or I will be busted first thing I know. Guess I better turn in. Got back my last exam paper. Didn't flunk after all, but came darn near it. Got about 63. Went down this afternoon and tried throwing the hammer. I was rotten. Didn't fire at more than 75. 
I never felt much better and never threw it any worse. This term, I've taken the hardest work I've ever had. My schedule consists of mechanics, materials, mineralogy, physical chem, and advanced quantitative analysis. It is going to be a difficult grind, but I'm ready for the worst. I made a dreadful mess of my speech. I just got scared stiff. I have had a bum time today. Went up without my lessons and was called on in everything. In lab this afternoon, the instructor came around and asked what was the matter on the exam. I told him, said that he had thought I had done a pretty good work in lab and was surprised to see me do so bum in the exam. Went over to the library and read a little. I have got to wake up and dig in. I have been thinking tonight that I would have done better going to a small college. I'm afraid I am going to be a big fizzle. Lord, help me not to be a disgrace and failure. Didn't know much today. Flunk to beat all. Work is piled high here and I hardly know where to begin, but I expect to get everything straightened out. I'm pretty scared of that exam tomorrow. I should have studied harder. The university frequently had to resort to busting students. February 7, 1908. I never saw anything like the way the faculty has dropped people this term. In all, 650 bus notices were sent out, more than ever before. A large percentage of that number will get in again on probation, but a whole lot of them are required to leave town within five days. Two sophomores in our house will have to go. One of them has not done his work. The other deserves, by all means, to stay. Just happened not to hit some of the final exams. It's so all over the hill. Fellows are being dropped right and left regardless. The entrance, the entrance requirements have been raised in all of the colleges. In medicine, an arts degree will be required hereafter, etc. Some of the fraternities have lost from five to a dozen. Women at Cornell had to cope with regulations, even as they were trying to develop their own independence. 1913. Sadie and I went to the concert last night with three other girls. The house mother looked very sober when we told her we were going to go, but that did not influence us. I do not see why five girls cannot go down to the opera house in a bus and back without people holding up their hands in horror and saying that it is not proper. I have been reading on women's rights today. Perhaps that is what makes me so strong in my protestations. The warden of Sage College has made a rule that all skaters must be in Sage by 9 o'clock, reporting to her when to go and return. Heard Professor Hayes of the Baptist Church. We had quite a party of escorts home, but I do not approve of such actions. I want to be independent, and I feel perfectly capable to walking up the hill, even if it is dark. Imagine how hot the discussions were about the new rules. They are rather strict. It seems to me the worst ones are that girls can, cannot go walking after 8 o'clock. That is, they must be in by then. Girls cannot go down to the theater unless accompanied by a chaperone or an escort. In the afternoon, two girls may go together without a chaperone, but in no larger groups. The theater rule is rather arbitrary, not letting more than two girls go together. For my own part, it would seem wise to me to let more goes, girls go, for I think that I would rather sit with a lot of girls than have men on all sides of me. But we shall see. Cornell challenged students' perception. Here is David Kogan in 1946. I've been studying the Jews here on campus. Of the approximately 1,500, about 100 are truly tied to Jewish values and traditions in the modern sense of the term. Then there are about 60 who are Orthodox and do not have anything to do with conservative Hillel House. Another one or 200 enjoy going to services and are sympathetic to Jewish tradition. A factor almost unknown among Yonkers youth are the 300-odd radicals who work for the PAC and the Negroes and Russia, but have nothing to do with anything Jewish even refusing to come to Hillel House for social activities. Nevertheless, they hang together at the universal meetings where Jews predominate. The remaining 900 are in between. Some come to occasional services, most going to, to Hillel House, but not at all really concerned with Jews and Judaism. And there is always the issue of money. Students always need it. Parents are requested to send it. 1895. Please send me $20. I will pay for three weeks' board, and the $5 will keep me in funds till the next installment, I hope. Dear Mother, I said that I would need $40, and you have sent $25. Papa, I have a little pink card that says tuition, $40, must be paid on or before October 5th. How does that strike you? Like a cannonball? 1933. I think I have enough money to last till the end of May. I have about $12 in the bank. Much good that does. A $50 check from the university, 
and about $25 in cash. I told you the lucky break I had of being able to, t to cash Daddy's check at the co-op about two days before the banks closed. 1951. I'll give you my finances. I'm going to the bank this afternoon. Arrived Cornell with $33.30 cash. Spent $2 at class dues, eighteen fifteen books, $3.03 alarm clock, $0.85 cents paper and ink, $1.05 soap shampoo. Now I have eight twenty-two left. Please send my fur coat as soon as you can. And Megs reported home in 1957 about Cornell. We had a panty raid last Thursday. All the boys, freshman boys anyway, stood outside the dorm yelling, We want panties! We want panties! They even got the bars off one of the downstairs windows, but it turned out to be the head maid's room, and she scared them away. <laughs> it is rumored that the raid was led by campus patrol and had been planned as a consolation prize for not having a fall weekend. They knew about it around 8 o'clock that evening, and they wouldn't let anyone out of the dorm. Not even me for astronomy lab. But that didn't matter, because there were no stars anyway. All of us were watching out the window at them, even though we had explicit instruction not to. Unfortunately, they didn't get anything. The girls in our corridor want to have a DVD raid. Don't you think that would be a good idea? Many students wrote about being at Cornell. Amy? 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 Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have, you don't have that page? Nope. <laughs> oh. Sorry about that. We didn't have that one. Uh, life around here rolls along at a great rate, and I wouldn't be any other place for all the money in the world. Our football team is wonderful. The campus is beautiful. The girls are swell. Classes are awful, as they always are, and there's not enough food. It's raining dismally today, and there's no rain oh, in the world as wet as Ithaca rain. Well, this is still the most beautiful, beautiful place I've ever seen. And now and again, when I'm walking on the campus and looking at the trees and the lawn and the hills across the lake and down the valley, I remember to think how lucky I am just being here and get the humble elation of an airplane trip. The final word count for the entire book turned out to be 14,511 words. That is quite a lot, and I don't think I have ever written that much before on one assignment. However, those are 14,511 words that I enjoyed writing. The making of this scrapbook was very pleasurable. Otherwise, I would have little to nothing to remind me of my first semester. Lastly, I feel like this semester was nothing like what I had anticipated in any aspect. However, I feel that my semester has exceeded in every aspect, and I can only hope that the rest of my time at Cornell will be as pleasurable. So many voices. Over time, they reflect change, but there are also continuities, too. The weather, the workload, the place, the experience. And the students are still writing. It takes a different form today, for the most part. Few admit writing letters or keeping a diary, but they do send emails, and they are writing blogs. Their voices are there to be captured and at some time enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you.